All right, so um, why do we need fermions in, so, so again, hi, Luigi. Hi. <laughs> so let's see, we have this action that we're talking about, something like this, or some variant, or some variant of this. There is some noise in your background, is that like somebody else is there? Ah, I think it's my brother talking okay, okay. to someone. Okay, so can you can you mute yourself unless you have something to say? I mean, so we have an action which looks like uh, Into... Didn't we, instead of doing like that, didn't we con contract the Zweibans yeah, with themselves and add extra fields to contract the indices of the axis? Right, right, right. So, so I'm going to write down the different possibilities. Right, so this is equivalent to the standard Polyakov action, right? Okay. Now, um, so I just want to go over the physical picture, right? The physical picture that I have in mind. So we have some 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 background, right? And this background is described in terms of some spin network. Something like this. And in this background, we have a we have a surface. Uh, let's call it S. Right? And wherever this surface is punctured by these by these edges, so the edges which uh, are orthogonal to the surface, so to speak. At those points, you get a single quantum of area, right? Uh, which is, uh, goes as something like, uh, there's an LP square. Gamma is this image the parameter, right? And this is the J label on the on the edge. Now, what the idea is, the goal is, right? Is to say that when we zoom out. Right when we go on a on a large scale, so this is on a on a small scale. I'll call this 
LQG. <laughs> Actually, I just realized that that's a, but what I mean is LQG meaning the length scale of quantum geometry, not quantum gravity, quantum geometry. And since this looks too much like LQG, I'll call it L Planck instead. So let's call this N Planck. And then the idea is that you zoom out. And when you zoom out, now again, you have this surface S. But now, the you are approaching a continuum approximation, right? So the effective lattice spacing, there is an effective lattice that is, that is induced on the surface S due to the graph in which it is embedded, right? And so this effective lattice spacing, uh, we can call this A, let's say. And so, and there is some scale, let, let's call that LS, right? So that's the string scale. And LS is greater than probably much greater than L Planck. So what happens at this scale, right? At this scale, the physics of this surface is should be described by something like the Polyakov action. Right. You forgot square root of determinants. Actually thinking about it, you forgot some the actions up there also. No, that's because I put a tilde up there. I put a tilde, oh. densitized triad. But the densitized triad, diodes carries a factor of determinants of diodes. And the and so with no, both I, diodes, I, you you have determinant squared of the diodes. No, I think it's the square root of the. Okay, it's well, a, it's fine. the square root of determinant of the metric. At no, least, no, fine. At, at uh, least be, I think it's that on Rovelli's book. Let me see. Right. Well, to be to be oh, safe. I don't have it here. To be safe, I'll just instead of doing all of that, we'll just work with this, right? So we are, we are safe, okay? All right. Now, what is the, the, the idea, right? The idea is that first of all, there should be some corrections to this, which should come from the quantum geometry effects, that's the first thing. The second, and so what What should, and should, should those only be corrections to this action or should they modify the action in some way, right? And so what are all these punctures doing, right? These punctures should have some effect, right? Because what we are saying is that this theory this action is the effective field theory of these of the of this lattice, right? Of these punctures. So now let's look at what happens if you have a punctured surface, okay? And I'll just put a regular lattice on this for simplicity. This is a surface. These are punctures. So what each puncture does is that at each point, it's like putting a single fermion. 
and for simplicity now here's the thing see one can always you know in an arbitrary spin network the j values can the j can take any value right the j can take one half one three halves right it can take any value but there are good reasons to believe that j is equal to one half should be the dominant value so we will work with j is equal to one half we'll we'll assume all the punctures that j is equal to one half then the next subdominant term should come from j is equal to one, then j is equal to three halves and so on, right? So this is our dominant term. So that's why I'm putting these uh, spins at each lattice site, okay? And so on, okay? Now, we can see that there are these edges which are connecting these, these lattice sites, right? And what is living on these edges, right? On these edges, you have some gauge connection that is living, right? Which tells you how to parallel transport a spinner from one side to another side. Just a minor technicality. Mm -hmm. it, sure, it sure, sure. It the connection needs to have two internal indices. In two dimensions, you can't turn two indices into one. In two dimensions, oh. you, you turn you can turn two indices into no ind index, but not into okay. one. Okay. Okay. Good point. Thank you. You're right. Because, yeah, okay, so we have this 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 connection, right, and it's parallel transporting the these spinners along along some path. If I say this is gamma, right so anyway we we know all that now what will so if we ask ourselves, what is the physics of this sheet of punctures, right? It will be described by some, some effective theory, right? Now, well, what is the simplest effective theory, the simplest effective theory that one can have, let's say, and I'll write down in terms of a Hamiltonian now, but we'll come back to the action uh, picture a little bit later. The simplest effective theory one could have, right? Is just the, that all the spins are uncoupled and um, you just sum over all of them. This is your Hamiltonian, let's say. Okay. So of course, it, it, there can also be another term like this, which is linear in all the spins. So we'll, we'll, we'll just keep both of these terms. The, the, this is the simplest case, right? The non-interacting. Now, obviously if there are no interactions, then you can't really talk about a surface, right? Surface means that there is some connectivity between the different parts of the surface. So there should be some interactions. So we can ask, well, what should happen to the to this Hamiltonian? How should it change? So I'll call this H0 plus some interaction term. And again, for simplicity, we can take what is the simplest interaction term? Well, harmonic oscillator. No, no, uh, Ising model or Ising model. Right? This is saying that 
you are just coupling the neighboring spins and there is a constant coupling between the neighboring spins given by J. And this is a ferromagnetic, uh, this describes a ferromagnetic state because when the J's are parallel, so I, sh I should put a vector or something. When the J's are parallel to each other, then the Hamilton Hamiltonian, the energy is minimized because parallel spins will con give you one, right? Anti-parallel spins will give you minus one when you take the dot product, right? So this is the, describes a ferromagnetic state if J is positive and anti-ferromagnetic if J is negative. Okay. Now, so <clears throat> now one can, again, let's come back to what we want to do. We want to, we want some sort of, this is, this is our goal, right? We want to understand what happens to this to this action, right? So that question is equivalent to asking, what is the continuum limit of this Hamiltonian edge, or at least? That will give us part of the answer, right? The what is the continuum limit of this Hamiltonian? Now it turns out that for one D also and for two D, Ising model. or easy model, the continuum limit is of this form. Where this is a Majorana spinner. And Majorana, Majorana means that these are these are real objects. Okay, and uh, I'll just put a dagger here. And this and its Hermitian conjugate are independent uh, variables. Now, this is something that one can. Is it is it just the dagger? Wasn't it supposed to be the bar, the spin, or what? Yeah, I think I think in in I, let me let me just check again. In yeah, well, I, I, I don't know much about uh, Majorana spinners, no, I... neither spinners in dimensions other than four. So maybe, yeah, no, maybe, no, that's maybe that's, that's not uh... the case. But uh, usually it's the barred spinner, right? That, that it, yes, 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 gamma, yes, gamma, so I just... gamma knots are the equivalent of gamma knots in two dimensions times the, the Hermitian conjugates. Yeah, no, 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 so you're right. It is, it is, it is this, yeah. Okay. Now, um, and if you consider a, a model of this form, right? And if you treat it as a thermal system, then you can also say that there is a temperature, right? And then the system undergoes a phase transition at some critical temperature. Right, and at the critical temperature, at the critical temperature T is equal to T C, the model is described 
this continuum limit of the easing model is described by a pair of these Majorana fermions, right? And this This is a conformally invariant action, right? These are massless fermions, so the system is conformally invariant. Luigi, can you hear me? Ah, okay. I thought you were frozen for a while. Since you're dealing with a potentially curved yeah. surface, shouldn't there be a the term, the term square root of determinant of metric, or no? No, no. Okay. So just now, I'm I'm just talking about right now. I'm just talking about a lattice, right? A plain lattice. Yeah. Right. No, but we're I mean, in that about... action of the continuum limits, shouldn't there be the? No, the no. But right, like I like I said, this action doesn't know about the metric and all that because it we, uh, it comes from this hamiltonian which doesn't have any such uh, information i see okay right and so so this is the reason so this is the reason why i'm of the opinion that this quantum gravity action over here, or this quantum gravity modification to the Polyakov action, it will contain some fermions of some sort. And the reason I really like this is because we are not putting in these fermions by hand, right? They are arising as a result of the quantum geometry of the surface itself. Right, that's the first thing. The second thing is that if we are to say that this surface S is described by some sort of a string theory, right, then what we know from string theory is that there should be some, conf you know, the, there should be conformal invariance of the, you know, of the action, right? Well, they can, there'll be a conformal anomaly and so on and so forth, but then you deal with that later, right? But to begin with, your action should have uh, conformal invariance. So having such a action appear naturally, right? From the simplest possible interactions you can have between, between spins on a surface, Right? I think that's, I find that particularly compelling, okay? Now, again, when the, when is this action arising? This is arising in the limit in a certain assumption that we have made that all the J labels are one half, right? So then the question, the next, the next question would be, right? What if there are some higher spins in between. For some of the edges, right? Which will, which you would expect statistically, right? And this will be the next higher order. This will give you more corrections or this will give you some other terms in the action, right? But to the lowest order, one can forget about this for the time being. Now, there is also a very good uh, statistical mechanical argument for why we should consider graphs which have uh, this thing. with j is equal to one half labels, okay? And um, I don't want to go into that right now because it will sort of 
de deviate from the main thread. But the origin of this argument lies in the in something called uh, BGS stands for Brownstein, Ghosh, and Severini entropy. So what happened is that two people originally Severini and and Passer, Passerini, I think, or if I'm not getting that wrong. They asked, what is the entropy of an arbitrary network? Okay. Then this was uh, applied by Brownstein, Ghosh, and Severini to the question of the entropy of a spin network. Right. So the what happens is you can construct uh, a density matrix corresponding to any spin network. How do you construct that? You start with the graph. The graph has an adjacency matrix. Do you know what the adjacency matrix of a graph is? So the if you have any graph, right, it is described by an adjacency matrix, which tells you that if two edges are connected, if I is connected to J, then Aij is not equal to zero. Otherwise, it's zero. That's that's pretty much the statement of the adjacent matrix. Then you can have self loops and all that. If you have self loops, the diagonal uh, elements will also be non-zero. And then you can also describe directed and undirected graphs by saying whether this matrix is symmetric or anti-symmetric or some you know because if you say a i j it's going one way a j i is going the other. So using this matrix and uh, another object, uh, which is the degree uh, matrix, you can construct a graph Laplacian. And then uh, you can define, so you, you can define a, a a density matrix row and you can ask what is the von neumann entropy of this density matrix right and this density matrix depends on this laplacian i think i i there are some minor things that I'm missing out. This von Neumann entropy, now you can ask, you can ask what sort of density matrices is it minimized for or extremized alternative, you know. It turns out, right, and they've shown this, that it is minimized uh, for uh, this thing. For regular graphs, meaning that all the vertices have the same degree, degree is the number of edges coming into any vertex. For regular graphs with uh, j is equal to one half. Okay, so this the, the spin labels come into the definition of this density matrix. Right, it's constructed from the spin labels and the and the adjacency matrix. You need both of those, right, for the. So, so this tells us that uh, is it minimized or maximized? <laughs> I forget. It's it's one of the two. Probably maximized, thing, right? Because entropy always increases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably, probably. <laughs> So this tells us that, you know, if you're looking at some ensemble of graphs and you consider all possible graphs, what is, what is your typical state going to be like, right? The typical state is going to be 
something which consists of regular graphs with spin labels one half. Right? So you have this quantum form, right? You have this idea of quantum form, right? Which goes back to Wheeler. And <laughs> that you basically have some infinite reservoir, right? In which all possible geometries are bubbling around. Right? But why we don't see all those geometries, right? Because so there is some thermal mechanism or argument which uh, damps out the contributions from geometries which are weird, right? And what this is one candidate for such a such a thermal thermal mechanism, okay? So this is just to provide justification for the assumption that J is equal to one half. If you build upon this, then you can say that your continuum limit, right, will be described by some Majorana fermions. Right, so what is the end result of all of this? The end result, well, we're not at the end yet, but is that and there'll be some coupling constant here and I'll just uh, work with the standard Polyakov action just for simplicity. And now I'm going to just throw in that root of minus G that you said is needed, right? And uh, there's also, I, I forgot here, there is going to be, like there'll be some factor of gamma mu to contract this mu index. Okay. Now, <clears throat> now the, okay, so, so this is, this is my argument for why fermions will appear. Okay. What I have not yet figured out or managed to explain yet, right, is that, so for this part, there is some microscopic justification given in terms of the quantum geometry structure. But uh, we don't have that yet for this for this part of the Polyakov action. But no, actually we do because right. So I mean, because if if you are going to say that this comes from quantum geometry, then this should also come from quantum geometry, right? And what? Where does this come from? Which part of the quantum geometry does this come from? Well, you have the, the, these, these lowest order terms, right? The linear term and the quadratic term. Now, earlier in the beginning, I said that the area associated to a surface goes as the Casimir associated with J. But there are also very, very, very good arguments actually for saying that, that there is a second, that A actually goes as J. Instead of as root of J times J plus one, it goes as J. Okay. And if you say that it goes as J, 
and again like i said there are there are good there is good reason to think that this should be the case of course if you say that it goes as j then you have to ask uh well what is wrong with the root of j times j plus 1 prescription and where does that fail and i don't have the answer to all of those questions yet right i'm trying to because it's like a detective story right i mean you're trying to like take all these clues and you're trying to like build a picture and you can't answer every question right at least not like when you're still understanding what is trying, what you what is going on right so if we say that we have this j term right well then what is that going to do that is going to give us this area right because i mean i'm writing it as a polyakov action but the polyakov action is a form of the nambugoto action right originally then what is the nambugoto action the nambugoto action is just the area of the surface right and if we say that the area goes as 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 j then what is the area of the surface it's just the sum over all the j's right so this part comes from this part comes from h not and this part we can view as coming from the interactions how is it so far looks interesting i think it makes sense up to now right i mean look the, the, the free theory is given by just the area and then you have the interaction where you have to take into account uh, the spins and everything so maybe there's where the connection appears right so right so the, now the, conne the that, connection might need, might need to appear on the interaction term then because it's where, yes, it, it's where you parallel transport things not so yes. the free term. yes 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 now okay so so that so that's the that's the third part of the puzzle right and i think you don't need to mute yourself i think your background noise is sub, sub, subsided i don't know you can oh okay so the third part right is there should be something related to the to the connection right yeah and there should be some effect of the background connection also and there should be some effect of the induced connection on the on the world sheet also mm. right the, the background connection naturally should appear on the x mu x mu no so no no background connection meaning the bulk connection yeah the bulk and, connection should and, naturally appear on x mu uh, no no the okay so so let me tell you how let me tell you how the background connection appears or is brought into the picture in 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 conventional string theory mm. so we'll call this young milder or we'll call this s gauge let's say mm -hmm. okay and okay. what what will be where does this come from so if you look at for instance how they describe the coupling of the background gauge field let's say you have some bulk gauge field which is you can write like this uh amu uh one second yeah amu i just, just a question on the interaction action 
The spinners mm -hmm. are world are world sheet spinners, not book spinners. They are world, they, these are world world sheet spinners. Yes. So that uh, gamma mu d mu, partial mu should be with internal with world sheet indices, right? World sheet indices. So I should I should not use mu nu. Yeah. Right. Those I are should world use indices. Okay. I should use lower this thing labels. Good. Okay. Okay. Makes now, how how are, how is the effect of these background gauge fields introduced? So this is basically what is called what is the you know super string act, the the action for the for the chiral chiral super string. Mm -hmm. It has a term of this form. Let me write down the term. This is your gauge field. And this gauge field is a function of the coordinates, right, of your bulk. Yes. And and what are the coordinates of your bulk? They are given by your embedding fields, the x's. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then, uh, what else is there? There is a. I'm trying to get all my indices right. Uh, there is this. And then there is a contraction with. Uh, I'm I'm following. I'm trying to follow this uh, paper by by Kalan Kalan or Kalan from 1985. Strings in background fields, which is probably not the state of the art, but you know, uh, if any experts happen to, some, it should give some useful insight at least. Yeah, I mean, right. And then there is, uh, let me see, let me put this I down here. There's a J I term. And then we have to contract this A also with something. This J I sure. is, is what? The generators of the, the, the group? Yeah. So what is this J I? Now, let me give you the form of this J I. This J I is given by Ah, okay. The first psi mm -hmm. is is psi or psi bar? I I think it's 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 just psi. Just psi, okay. Yeah, from what I what I see in 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 Kalan. Okay. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Okay, so basically, what is going on here, right? Is that if you remember from uh, electrodynamics, also these, these ABs are spinner indices, not word sheet indices. No, so yeah, no, no. So this this is a this is a word sheet index, right? This derivative term here. No, I mean on the and side. One uh, one second, one second. Let me just. Get back to you in one second. Let me. Okay. Um, right. So okay. So so this thing. Uh, let me. If I'm going to use uh, Callan's term, uh, this B is actually a derivative in the super space, and it's written like this. So you can take your sigma tau, your world sheet coordinates, and you can write them in terms of the holomorphic coordinates, right? Yeah. Z and Z bar, yeah. which is just taking the so real plane and mapping it to the complex coordinates, right? And then this theta is the, uh, this thing, is the super partner of the uh, real, co of the uh, real space, so to speak, Z and Z bar. So this D is the covariant derivative, the super space covariant derivative. So there is no index over here. Oh, okay. So, so you don't need to contract. Right, 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 right. Now, and, and this kind of a term, so in, in ordinary electromagnetism, right, you have, this is your uh, 
for the for the electromagnetic part right mm -hmm. and now what do you do if you want to if you have some currents right if you have some some a wire carrying current right or some sort of current you density have to how do you the, the fuse with the currents this is oh. right oh, okay. this is the like, this is the lorentz invariant term which couples the current to the gauge field yeah right mm -hmm. so that is what is happening over here yes right the fermions on the world sheet generate some sort of a current in the bulk mm. and then that current in the bulk couples with the gauge field but there is an extra extra term of this form that is present and again wait um, a current in the bulk oh yeah because there is a function of the bulk yeah i just got confused because of the inkets, but yeah it's a function of yeah x. yeah it's yeah a function of capital x that's right that's right which one the the cur the entire object yeah yeah the size are a function of x also right yeah that's what you mean yeah yeah it's just that uh, i got confused because of the index because it's not a, a space time book index but that's not the point the point is that it's a function of the book coordinates not that the index is a coordinates yeah i I, I, some... I, I, I I get lost on that sometimes something along those lines right yeah so so this is how you you couple these uh, right this is so and this is called your this is called your background right in this case this is your background right mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So once we have these fermions, right? They will have to couple to the bulk, the background bulk field, right? For exactly the same reason that you have this term which appears in the chiral superstring action. But again, uh, going by uh, my personal prejudice against supersymmetry, <laughs> just because it is, it is a kind of sketch to say the least. Well, it just it just brings in a lot of complexity. You know, it just brings in a lot of complexity. Yeah. So I would prefer not to have super sort symmetry. Of super, super symmetric, right? I would I would prefer to. So if you now we have this bulk gauge field, mm -hmm. right? And we want to couple it to the background. Uh, to sorry to the world sheet currents. How do we do that? In a, in our case. The so, bulk, so let, let it me have two indices, right? In our case, right. So if I don't use the, if I don't use the, this, it should it should have two two internal indices, right? Ij, because it's no, the no you, no, you can no or, you can write it as you uh, even if you have you, two indices. Uh, mm. No, even if you have two indices, you can always write it as one index. I mean, it's just. That's it's just only packaging. true in three, in three dimensions. If you have uh, anti-symmetric, no. two anti-symmetric mm -hmm. indices, it becomes one in three dimensions. No, no. So in two dimensions, so it becomes no index. In no, no. So that doesn't happen. No, no. See, that's what what you're saying, right? Is the duality of forms that is present in three di three dimensions. Uh, but you can always package your indices and write them as one. Ah, yeah, you like can you, you can contract this is just, with some appropriate objects. Sorry, okay. This is just packaging. Okay, okay. You are just contracting okay. with some appropriate objects to turn into one. Right. It just so, labels the generators. Okay. 
so you, we don't you don't want to con confuse this with uh, what do you call it uh, okay so we have this this background uh, field right and we want to couple it to these fermions so we introduce this 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 current here right mm -hmm. and then uh, would this be sufficient um, well you have this mu index also right so what are you going to do with this mu index so uh, well you have x mu now i don't quite understand the effect of including this derivative term of the embedding fields in this in this okay i don't quite mm -hmm. understand the physical like what is going on what is the physics of that i mean that is important so but if we are not working with supersymmetry what does that d mean because that's d relies on supersymmetry right Right. With the, so with the super partners on everything. Right, 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 right. So for now, I'll just write it as d a x mu, and uh, then you then you need something to to kill the. A. I'll just put something, a placeholder for the time being. Okay. Okay. Some tau a something. Okay. Okay. And. So this, right, this is the term which is responsible for the, uh, what do you call it? Uh, in string theory, this is the term which generates the background Young-Mills theory. The addition of this term, so what happens is, uh, again, let me, uh, uh, one second. Okay, well, I don't know exactly how it how it works out. It it's basically the beta, there's a beta function. Okay, so I've explained this beta function picture to you in the past for the for the bulk uh, graviton. This is your bulk graviton, right? And you just treat it. You just treat these as coupling constants for a two-dimensional field theory, which is this one. Mm -hmm. And then you apply renormalization to calculate the beta function, which is the which is how does do these coupling constants change as a function of energy scale? Because that's what the renormalization group allows us to do. And we find that the beta function, so when it vanishes, uh, that means you're at a critical point, the vanishing of the beta function corresponds yeah. to the case when this satisfies this Ricci flatness. The Ricci curvature con constructed from this background metric is, uh, is zero. So the similar thing happens uh, with these with this with these other fields. Again, you treat this as a coupling constant, some background field, and you apply this. Uh, you calculate the beta function associated with this gauge field, right? Or with these coupling constants, and that beta function uh, yields the uh, the Yang-Mills action. Okay, so again, <laughs> exactly, I mean, I, I know the, the big picture, okay, 
but I'm not going to claim that I know uh, everything that is going on. But but that that big picture is 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 how things things work out. Okay. So what do we have so far? We have the area of the world sheet, which corresponds to the Nambugoto action. Then we have the interactions between the spins, which gives us the fermions, right? And all of this, we have to, now we have to ask ourselves the following question. Which is that, um, if you look at the bulk action for loop quantum gravity, or the not loop quantum gravity, just, just GR and Ashtika variables, right? AA stands for Abhayashtik. So in Ashtika variables, what is the GR action look like? It looks like this. That is without the host term, right? Right, right. This is the right. This is the right. This is the uh. This is just the Einstein Einstein, 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 Hilbert action. And then, right, if you add the whole term, which is, uh, what is the whole term again? Uh, well, you don't, it you don't, this, you, the whole term, you don't take the hodge of the, of the right. sensor it's, of the field strength. Right. It, it's just this, right? Yeah. You don't take the hodge of the field strength. It, it's just this, right? So you contract i, j, i, j here. And where does the gamma appear in this? I forget. Uh, one over gamma. Uh, right. So the coupling have, constant you, is you, one by. You have, yeah, yeah, you have the same coupling constant of times and Hubert, one over 16 pi g oh, times yeah. one over gamma. Times one over gamma, right. So it's one over 16 pi g gamma. Yeah, that's right. So then I have to call it something else. Ask sticker holes or something. Mm -hmm. Right. So now the thing is that uh, it's it's far from clear that if you have a string which consists of these ingredients and you calculate the beta function of the these uh, these a fields and now here's the thing by the way there there will be another term corresponding to the e fields also because now you have the e field the the background we are we are buying mm -hmm. right there will be some beta function corresponding to that also and it's it's far from clear how you will obtain this as the low energy limit
of some string action. Yeah. But so, but but we have many of the ingredients we need. The first ingredient is at the Planck scale in terms of quantum geometry. Mm -hmm. Then the next ingredient is at the string scale in terms of the area plus fermions. I'll write it as root H plus fermions plus A mu. And then consistency would require maybe again. There is right consistency would require that at some large enough scale uh, that we'll call LG. This will for, reduce regular gravitation on gauge theories. Right. But in what form? In the form. In the mm -hmm. form of Young Mills, plus Ashtaker, plus Holes, plus Fermions. Yes. yes. Right? So this is not... How do, we, how do we bridge the gaps? Not clear. But again, if one can do all three of these uh, steps, right? If you can construct all three of these levels and connect them, then I mean, I think that this is something that you would be able to call a theory of quantum gravity. Yes. Right? And not just in some hand wavy sense. Hey, in a very, very concrete sense, where you have quantum geometry is also there, stringy dynamics is also there, and then semi-classical geometry is also there. Mm -hmm. And this solves the important question of what is the continuum limit of loop quantum gravity? So what happens when you do the loop quantum gravity this quantization, right? You go down in this direction. Mm -hmm. But then you don't know how to go back up. It's not clear. Mm -hmm. But if there is an intermediate scale, the string scale. Uh, now we know how to, how to do this. Then the string scale allows us to connect quantum geometry to semi-classical or semi-classical gravity. Yeah. So this is the sense in which you remember when I first discussed this idea with you, right? I told, I told you like how there is this uh, notion that unfortunately has developed that do for for very very good reasons unfortunately oh. but it has developed that string ah. theory is wrong or string theory is yeah, string yeah, theorists have lied to yeah. us <laughs> and so on and so forth and of course that 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 didn't have an, happen in a vacuum ah. you know just like october 7 didn't happen in a vacuum. <laughs> that also didn't happen in a vacuum Right. It, it was the result of decades of, uh, well, you know, I mean, it's easy to look back. Hindsight is twenty twenty. So, you know, I'm not going to sit in judgment of pe people like Gross and Witten and Maldesena and all that. But nobody has all the answers, right? If, every, if there was one person who had all the answers, then we wouldn't need to do... So, 
so so this picture accommodates strings also it accommodates quantum geometry also right and it provides the answer of what is the continuum limit of loop quantum gravity and as i told you at that time string theorists will not be happy with this picture because they will think that strings are not fund fundamental anymore and well but i think that is something that is more of a more of a you know has to do with with one's ego uh, rather yeah. than because because i mean it is the essential yeah. physics which connects quantum geometry to semi classical physics yeah. without yeah. it you don't have it you know without it you don't have any of these connections and without mm -hmm. the work that all the string theorists had done this picture also would not have been possible yes right it's this picture doesn't exist in isolation independent of all of the work that has been done in string theory right so again whether this is true is what you and i have set out to take a tentative step towards yes so i'll stop the recording at this point and we'll discuss more no can stop the recording okay